Hey guys, um, I thought we would take a uh, break from Pear Deck today um, so that I could present uh, this video lecture to you. Let me get it set up and then we'll go. Hello, how's it going? Um, I just wanna say first of all that I was really impressed with um, uh, how well you guys did with the Pear Decks last week. I know the first one was maybe a little bumpy to get started with, um, but I was really impressed by your responses. And the second one, I thought you had some really great theses. Um, I'll be giving you individual feedback through Google Classroom about those. Um, but I like that tool and I think you can um, uh, plan to see more of that um, in the weeks ahead. Um, for today, I thought I would give you a video lecture and I also discovered this really cool tool, check this out, where I can give you captions, closed captions for my video lecture. So um, if it's really hard to hear in wherever you're watching, um, you can still follow along and see what's going on. So um, a couple quick reminders. Number one, we are four weeks out from the exam. If you hadn't been paying attention, um, the exam is only going to cover periods three through seven. That will be the focus of the prompt for the DBQ. Um, so I am doing kind of a, a marriage, an unholy alliance of um, content, um, thematic overviews, um, kind of the themes of the course and some skills practice from week to week. So um, last week was period three, this week will be period four. Today I'm gonna to talk about migration and settlement, which is the um, M in our campsites. And then next class I'll talk about politics and power, which is the P in campsites. We're also going to be practicing this week contextualization. That's what your assignment is going to be at the end of this video lecture. Um, and I'm gonna give you a couple of pointers um, to help you remember how to do really well with that as well. But first, let's talk about migration and settlement. So um, to give you a thematic overview of this and kind of all the various pieces of content that you might um, use if you were writing about migration and settlement, um, here, this is directly from the College Board's um, course exam uh, description, this, this phrase right here. So uh, migration and settlement has to do with push and pull factors that shaped immigration to and migration within America and these demographic, uh, and the demographic change as a result of these moves, which shapes the migrants, society, and the environment. Um, and then I have a whole list of examples over here for you on this side. Um, you have probably seen, hopefully you've seen three of these little tables at this point organized by themes. I'm going to pull all of those together for you guys in a document um, and we'll be sharing that with you soon as a, a review resource um, and maybe something that you want to have near you while you're taking the exam since it is open notes. Um, so I'll let you read that on your own. If you wanna pause now, you can. My head may also be blocking some of those details, um, but uh, never fear, you will be getting that information um, in a more accessible format soon. Um, just a quick note on terminology. Um, settlement, I think, is a, a pretty comfortable term for us. It means people settling somewhere. Um, but immigration, sometimes we get a little bit tripped up on. There are three sort of related terms when it comes to immigration. Um, and they are not, they don't mean the same things, even though sometimes students use them interchangeably, which is not correct. The first one here is emigrate. Um, if you are an emigrant, you are someone who is leaving a country. If I decided I am done, um, with America, and I'm gonna go live someplace that doesn't have any cases of COVID-19, like, honestly, I don't even know where, the Marshall Islands or Micronesia or something like that, I would be an emigrant from the United States. I would be emigrating to another country. If um, someone from, uh, let's say, um, well, I don't know who would wanna to move to the United States right now um, with coronavirus, since we have more cases than anywhere else in the world, but let's say you're a doctor who has the vaccine for this and you wanna get it out to people and you live in Papua New Guinea, but you wanna to come to the United States, then you are an Immigrant, you are coming into the United States, you are immigrating to the United States. The word migrate, typically from a US history perspective or a historical perspective more generally, just means movement within a country. So if I wanted to leave the great state of Illinois and go back to my homeland of Wisconsin, I would be migrating from one state to another. I wouldn't be emigrating because I'm still within the United States and I wouldn't be immigrating because I'm not leaving the United States to go someplace else. Does that make sense? I hope so. Um, when I think about immigration 
and settlement, excuse me, migration and settlement in a push, two major things that I think of are, um, first of all, manifest destiny, right? Which is maybe also related to American and regional culture, um, American and national um, society, um, American identity, right? So all, all of those other themes. And we know this theme really well, I think, um, or this topic really well, this idea of westward expansion and the idea that Americans have this sort of God-given right to occupy all of the land of North America. That's hugely important, not only because it's going to be the story of literal migrants within the United States going from east to west, but it's also going to be the story of displacement of native peoples and the clash of um, migrants and immigrant groups as Western immigration begins from Asia, um, right at the time that American um, settlers, migrants are kind of reaching the frontier on the West Coast. Super important theme. Um, Frederick Jackson Turner, right, in 1893 says that this is the process that shapes the American identity. Um, and it's absolutely a process of migration and settlement as well. The other theme um, or kind of major topic that I think is important in within this theme is just immigration broadly, right? We like to talk about America as a nation of immigrants, but we all know from an A-Push perspective that that is also a story of a lot of different conflicts. Um, and I think that's an important thing to remember and kind of have in the back of your head as you think about this theme, or if you were to get a DBQ that was about this theme. So within period four, as promised, um, period four, as we all know, is 1800 to 1848. Um, and uh, there are four topics sort of within that period that I want to focus on that I think relate to migration and settlement. These are certainly not the only major topics within period four. Um, I'm going to put up some um, Quizlet sets and Khan Academy articles if you need some help reviewing some of the other content of this historical period. Um, there's a lot of other stuff in here and other thematic things as well, but I wanted to just focus on these four topics um, for today's lecture. So um, let's get started with the market revolution. Remember this political cartoon? You guys wrote an SAQ about this, what feels like a million years ago at this point. Um, so the market revolution is this incredibly important development that happens during right smack dab in the middle of period four. Um, this is the first industrial revolution, right? Um, very important if you talk about the industrial revolution and you don't use the caveat of second industrial revolution happening in the 1890s, this is technically what you're talking about. It's a much earlier form of technological advancement and industrialization, um, but it happens um, to have a really huge impact on the United States, just like the second industrial revolution will have later. Um, the major changes are going to be, this results in an improvement of transportation networks, particularly steamboats and railroads because those both make use of the brand spanking new technology of steam power during period four. Um, this is huge because those transportation networks and also the kind of related use of things like machine tools and interchangeable tar uh, parts in American factories are going to create new products. And through those transportation networks, we're going to see new markets, um, meaning more new places where Americans can sell their goods. Instead of just being a Boston shoemaker who is selling shoes to just the people of Boston, now Boston shoemakers can maybe sell their goods as far west as some place like uh, Chicago or St. Louis. That means that there's new opportunities for money to be made, um, new new jobs on uh, things like the railroads, um, telegraph lines are going to follow the railroads very soon, right? So it's this kind of um, confluence of different events that is really about the movement of goods, um, but is also going to create new parts of the country that are going to be commercial hubs like Chicago, and that are going to attract people to live there, to migrate and settle there, because because of these changes in transportation. See how I looped it back to the theme? Boom, I aced it, you guys. All right, the second thing I wanna talk about is our good friend, Andrew Jackson. I think we also wrote a short answer question about this image earlier this year. Um, so Andrew Jackson is really associated with the birth of the Democratic Party, right? The, the same sort of Democratic Party that is around today, although with very different values than the Democratic Party of today. Um, the Democratic Party of Jackson's age is 
kind of um, exemplifies mistrust of the federal government, almost a return to that Jeffersonian anti-federalist um, sort of sensibility of an earlier era, right? More in like period three. Um, Jackson is really seen as kind of um, really riding, I think, rather than leading, but really riding this wave um, of expanding suffrage and political power to ordinary men, right? Getting rid of those property qualifications um, so that by the end of this period, we really see almost universal manhood suffrage for white men, right? Um, black men are not going to get the vote until the 15th Amendment in our next historical period. Um, but this is really seen as giving American political power to um, ordinary Americans for really the first time. It's a much less elitist form of political participation. Um, some other things that are happening during Jackson's time. Oh, I also want to just, just hop back one second to say, well, why is that happening? I'm not necessarily going to answer this question for you because I think the answer to why is um, male suffrage expanding during this time may help you contextualize uh, this topic a bit, um, but it has something to do with migration and settlement. I'll just leave it there. Um, other things I want to mention uh, related to the age of Jackson and kind of tied to this theme of migration and settlement. One of those things is the Panic of uh, 1837, right? One of our first um, financial panics, all of which seem to have threes and sevens in them. If you've noticed that pattern, right? There's 1837, there's 1873, uh, there's 1897. Um, I don't know what's going on there. 1893, right? There's, there's all the, I don't know what it means. If I was into Kabbalah, maybe I would be have a better answer for this. Um, but this economic downturn that happens during Jackson's time in office is really related to migration, or rather the speculation that Americans might be migrating um, to places like the Midwest. The federal government had been selling a ton of land. Um, uh, later, we're going to see much more land sales from the federal government to railroad companies, but this was more to individual settlers, and people were just not buying. So this, uh, there was a bubble that kind of burst here, and it brought the United States into a, an economic depression during this time. The last topic that um, I think we all think of when we think of Andrew Jackson is, of course, Indian removal, right? And the Trail of Tears, which you remember from your textbook, is really carried out more under his successor, Martin Van Buren. Um, but the decisions of Jackson's uh, uh, during Jackson's time in office are re will, what really lead to this process. So this is, of course, the United States government invalidating Native American land claims, um, mostly from those five tribes in the American Southeast, and then possessing those lands and moving through migration, forced migration, Native American populations more to the West and to a reservation system um, that's going to continue through uh, really the end of the 1800s, even into the 1900s. All right. <sighs> Need some water here or something. One second. I'll be right back. Oh, I can't take a break. Okay, never mind. We'll just power through. We'll power through. Next topic is slavery. So um, we uh, haven't really talked about slavery a little in a little while in this class, right? Um, if you you hopefully recall uh, from period three that the transatlantic slave trade was really booming um, during period three in the colonial and kind of early days of the American Republic, but that one of the many compromises um, created in the Constitution was that the Constitution doesn't really address slavery, but it is going to outlaw the international transatlantic slave trade um, in 1808. So. By the time we get into period four, um, there's no more international slave trading. There's no more importation of slaves from Africa that's happening um, in the United States. But that doesn't mean that the slave trade is going to stop by any means, right? Um, so you can see from these two images here, you have a map here in 1790 of, um, this is really the upper south, right? The Chesapeake area here. This is the Chesapeake Bay um, here in Virginia. I don't know if you guys know where that name comes from, but that's where it comes from. Um, this is... Uh, mostly going to be tobacco plantations up here right down in South Carolina. This is going to be maybe some more rice plantations. Um, but you can see the change by the time you get to 1860, where it's not just uh, slavery is not just confined to the upper south anymore. It's really spreading down here into the deep south. Now, how does that happen if slaves are not being imported? It happens through the domestic slave trade, right, which um, historians have started to call the second middle passage for African-American slaves in, in um, what is now the United States. Um, and the deep south is really going to start taking off towards the end of this period, perhaps also in connection with the market revolution as um, sort of the, the hotbed of American slavery. This is also where cotton is going to take the place of rice and tobacco as the um, premier 
cash crop that's being cultivated in these areas. Um, of course, along with the, mo the movement of slavery goes the movement of American slave culture, right? Um, already by, um, really by the time America becomes a country, we're starting to see kind of an autonomous African-American culture emerge in um, communities that have a lot of slavery in them. And that is going to move into the South along with slavery as an institution um, as a result of the domestic slave trade. Okay, last topic, European immigration. Um, remember immigration, I, I think is one of the themes that we see throughout American history, um, but particularly in, in period four, um, we're seeing the rise of two major immigrant groups that um, some historians have called the most successful um, immigrant groups in American history. The first is the Irish um, who are coming to the United States uh, mostly during the 1830s and 40s, um, in part because of the potato famine in Ireland, right? Um, the potato famine does not, impact wealthy, well-to-do Irish people or their British landlords. It really impacts the, um, the kind of serf class, right? The Irish working class, um, poverty stricken uh, um, farmers um, who are mostly, they're eating nothing but potatoes. Um, so potatoes uh, are not edible, um, they're not available, and so people have to find something else to eat. And so they move. Um, this is going to be related to um, not just the growth of an Irish population in the United States, but of course an anti-Catholic sort of backlash against that presence as well. Um, that will continue, um, I think, uh, as we've seen um, for many generations in U.S. history. Um, you can kind of uh, see some of this prejudice being reflected here in this political cartoon um, where you have uh, two men running away with the ballot box. They are both within um, casks of alcohol. You have Irish whiskey here on one side and lager beer over on the other. And of course, this would be a reference to German immigrants. So um, similar to uh, Irish immigrants, German people start leaving Germany, which is not really a unified country in the 1840s. It's a kind of a series of small um, city states that are at war with these, each other, essentially. And that political upheaval is a real push factor that's getting people to want to leave that country and find um, a new opportunity someplace else. Um, so German immigrants come and settle like Irish immigrants in many cities, mostly along the East Coast and kind of the Eastern part of the United States. Um, and both of these groups are really successful because in a lot of ways, they are much more able to assimilate to American culture than some of the other immigrant groups that will be following them later. That's not to say that they are welcome at the time that they come. We see a huge nativist um, backlash against these two immigrant groups. Um, nativism, of course, the idea that if you are not native born to the United States, although not Native American, um, that you are not truly American, which kind of loops us into the theme of maybe American identity as well. Okay, so that was a quick overview of four um, topics related to the theme of migration and settlement in period four. So now it is time for you to practice some contextualization of the one of those four topics. Head back to Google Classroom, check out the Google Doc that is there with lots of instructions um, and some other resources to help you remember how to do contextualization and give it a whirl. I will see you guys soon. Good luck. <laughs>